lecture, we will talk about basic principles of geospatial modeling of landscape processes. So we will discuss geospatial and dynamic aspects of models. We will describe some general approaches and methods and then look at some applications of hydrologic modeling and erosion modeling. So geospatial modeling of processes allows us to simulate landscape processes using computational methods using numerical simulations. And numerical simulations are becoming increasingly important as tools for gaining new knowledge. We are essentially using them to do virtual experiments which are difficult to do in landscape because we have very little control of the conditions and it is also uh, pretty difficult to expose landscape some extreme conditions such as extreme storms. So this is where the numerical simulations are extremely helpful. And as the computer uh, power increases and as we are getting more and more uh, data, we are able to move modeling of earth processes from empirical, spatially averaged and static models to more complex, more realistic process-based models that describe the phenomena in spatially distributed or, or spatially explicit way and that also describe the dynamics of the modeled phenomena with the ultimate goal to predict the modeled quantity such as water or sediment or chemical concentration at any point in space and time. So what are empirical and process-based models? Empirical models are based on statistical models that are derived from experimental data. That means that they are uh, based on number of experiments under given conditions and the relationship between the model phenomenon phenomena is derived using statistical tools. This advantage of these approaches is that they are applicable only to landscapes and on, only to conditions um, that were used for the experiments. So, so their applicability is rather limited or it requires a large number of experiments done under very different conditions. More generally applicable are process-based uh, models that are based on physical laws and it's usually continuity and mass conservation equations. Now it is important to note that empirical equations often have physics-based interpretation or were derived based on some simplified uh, physics-based uh, relationships. Uh, for example, they usually represent steady-state water flow or transport under uniform conditions but they have some physics, some physical principles in them, so they are not completely statistical. Then, on the other hand, physics-based equations, they are based on physical laws, but they often and practically almost always have empirical parameters. So again, they are more broadly applicable, but because of these empirical parameters, we can apply them only to situations where these empirical parameters are valid, where they were derived, and also to situations where the physical laws actually hold that describe the process. Now, from the point of view of geospatial simulations, it is important to understand spatially averaged and spatially distributed modeling. Geospatial simulations are distinct uh, from simulations in general that the modeled quantities 
are dependent or are function on position on Earth. So we are modeling phenomena and quantities such as water depth, concentration of pollutants, temperatures that are georeference that have some relation and they change in relation to their position on Earth. And these modeled phenomena are represented by continuous georeferenced fields. Now to run the numerical simulations we need to discretize these fields the same way as we discretize the, ma the mapped phenomena in GIS. And we can discretize them in different ways. We can use spatially averaged units for modeling and these are usually some polygons or areas, sub-areas of, of the larger region, region that we are trying to model. Very typical, very good example are hydrologic units, sub-watersheds or hill slope elements. So when we are working with spatially averaged units, we are replacing complex geometrical shapes with a very simple, simplified um, geometrical shape with averaged properties. Then we can also discretize these continuous fields using spatially distributed representation. And in that case, we will use meshes and these meshes can be irregular, for example, tins, or, um, or regular meshes, raster. Or this spatially distributed uh, representation can be also discrete random, uh, can be done by discrete random particles. So here is an example of uh, spatially averaged representation and spatially distributed representation. And in this case, we are looking at web, which is uh, a water erosion prediction uh, tool. So for example, we want to predict how much water and sediment is coming into this, uh, into this wetland. And you can see that it is coming from a watershed, which relatively simple topography, but there are convex concave shapes and it goes through this pond. And then it comes also from this second sub watershed, which is a little bit more complex topography with some concentrated flow and another little pond. So with the spatially averaged units, these watersheds are replaced by rectangles that have the same area as these areas and the slope of this area is the average slope of this sub-watershed. And here is the second one, again the same area and the slope will be the uh, average slope. So you can see that the flow over this rather complex topography with convergent water flow with some water dispersal, for example here, is simplified into uh, water flowing over tilted plane. But you can still get correct results by properly setting up the parameters of the model. And this is for water, this is spatially distributed representation of water depth, this is another spatially distributed representation from GeoWeb that shows, uh, shows the actual rates of erosion. So you can see that it's much more detailed. Here is another example of averaged and distributed modeling. Uh, here again, you have, uh, you have the results reported for spatially averaged hydrologic units. In this case, these are small watersheds. And we just report instead of showing how the erosion rates are distributed within this sub watershed, we just provide the average value for the entire watershed. This is good, for example, for regional planning, 
for targeting certain watersheds um, for conservation measures. But once we want to design where exactly we want to put the conservation measures, then we need spatially distributed modeling. And you can see that it can provide a very detailed, but also a very complex, um, complex spatial pattern of erosion. Uh, here the, the high erosion rates are in these, uh, in these red and uh, magenta areas. So you can see it is fairly complex and with high res resolution DEM we can actually capture impact of roads for example and, uh, and go much beyond just one uh, one averaged unit. So the, the conservation measures, for example, can be much better targeted and planned. And then another aspect of modeling uh, that uh, has evolved pretty rapidly is the uh, development of, uh, uh, of dynamic models. So while the static models are relatively easy to compute and they represent steady state, peak or average uh, fluxes or transport and they are often uh, estimated by empirical equations and they are still important and they are uh, very usually quite simple to, uh, to compute within GIS. More complex models are dynamic, they uh, describe the evolution of the modeled quantity over time and they are often modeled using numerical solution of partial differential equations. And here you can see an example of, uh, of dynamic modeling. So you can capture the spatial pattern of water flow at any time during the rainfall or after it started to rain. So here is water, uh, water depth at time t. So you can see that there is uh, there is water depth only where the runoff was generated. For example, this is forested area where at time T we don't have any runoff because everything was either infiltrated or captured by the vegetation. Here we have the same area at time Ti. Uh, you can see that water is starting to get into these vegetated areas. Uh, by flowing from the areas where the runoff was generated. And here is the steady state, uh, steady state water flow where the water uh, has passed all the way, uh, all the way to the outlet. And it can be, uh, can be visualized as uh, using animations so you can see how this water, uh, water flow evolves over time uh, when we have a uniform uh, steady rainfall. So you can see that the geospatial modeling can be pretty complicated, especially when we use process-based distributed and dynamic models. And what are the challenges? First of all, it is very data intensive. That means that we need to work with large heterogeneous data sets. And as you are working on your project, you already had some experience with how challenging this can be. Then another thing uh, with landscape processes is that we need to deal with complex multi-scale spatial, uh, spatial interactions. Um, and we also need to deal with high level of uncertainty and the validation of spatially distributed models is particularly difficult because mo most of the monitoring and measurements is done at individual points, for example, at outlets uh, of the watersheds, or we are measuring uh, um, meteorological uh, phenomena at the stations. And remote sensing helps, but remote sensing often uh, often is indirect. We are not measuring the modeled quantity directly, but we are deriving it from imagery or from some sensors. Mm. So again, that poses difficulties uh, with validation. And when we compare the accuracy in physics, when the controlled experiments can be performed, 
the simulations uh, simulations are often done uh, with 6 to 12 digits accuracy. In geosciences, the ac such accuracies are very difficult to achieve unless you have uh, controlled conditions. But if we are working in natural landscapes, it is quite common uh, that you have 50% differences even more uh, between the measurements and the model and you consider it uh, a success. The, the calibration and validation problems are usually tied with, uh, uh, with lack of sufficiently detailed input data and sufficiently detailed validation data. So we have some data with great accuracy, great detail, for example, topographic data are now available at um, very high accuracy. But the soil moisture data, for example, that, that uh, are equally important, uh, are not uh, available anywhere close to the accuracy and spatial, de spatial and temporal detail as we have for topography. So it is important to keep in mind that process-based distributed models do not necessarily improve accuracy. So if you are interested in water flow at the outlet of your watershed, when you replace your empirical model by process-based distributed model, you won't necessarily get more accurate results, but you will get more information and more insight into the processes because you can look at from which location how much water was contributing uh, uh, to the outlet. While spatially uh, averaged models don't provide you with that information. So how is modeling of processes linked to GIS? Uh, simple empirical models you can usually uh, run using GIS tools directly. You use the standard GIS tools to prepare the input data uh, and to write the equations that are needed for the models, for example, in MAP algebra. And then the result can be visualized again used standard uh, GIS tools. There are also models that are fully integrated within GIS as specific modules. For example, solar radiation models, we have already worked with them. They are implemented as dynamic and as sp spatially distributed models. Uh, more complex models uh, that require many different components or that try to model different, uh, uh, different, pro different coupled processes uh, are often linked to GIS as extensions or add-ons. And you can, they, they are usually, they usually use common data structures and uh, common interface with the, uh, with, the GI, uh, with the GIS. So they are relatively easy to use along with GIS. Then there are quite complex modeling systems that usually have coupled, uh, coupled models of different, uh, different processes. For example, they model the entire water cycle and such complex modeling systems are usually linked with GIS through data. So you prepare your input data in GIS, then you import it into the modeling system, and then you can export the results from the modeling system into GIS to do additional geospatial analysis. For example, uh, to find out how, uh, how certain pollution will affect uh, people living in certain counties. And then there are complex modeling systems that are standalone and they incorporate certain GIS capabilities that are needed to run the model and to uh, visualize the results. And in the next section, we will talk about uh, hydrologic modeling applications using GIS.